Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome. Yeah, welcome to week four of We. Now, I have a lot to cover today, and so I'm gonna, if I talk too fast, you can always watch it later on our website in slow motion, or you can read it uh, in my notes. Oh, okay, so if you have actually seen or heard all of the talks so far, and you're still here, I believe that you are what I thought you were, dedicated. If you've heard everything I've said so far and you actually came back, I'm impressed. Now, if you're a guest with us and you just have, and you maybe you just, you've missed the last three weeks because it's summertime and you've got things to do, then you really need to catch up. You really need to watch the videos for the last three weeks because I don't have time to catch you up today. So what I need you to do today is promise me that you'll watch all of them online today. In fact, I want you to turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to watch them all. Turn to your neighbor, say, I'm going to watch every one of them. Everybody do it, please. All right, thank you. All right, so, whew, got that out of the way. This way I can be totally honest with you because I hate being taken out of context. Since I know you're going to watch the rest of them, you'll be able to hear today in context. Is that me doing that? Holy cow. Is that this? Something's buzzing. All right, if you can't hear it, that's fine. Okay. Um, all right, so thanks for joining us. As I said, wow. Can we get that fixed, please? As I said, we are launching into an experiment in church membership. What we're doing here, this whole concept of we, this series that we're doing, is we're attempting to recreate the Acts 2 church. It's attempting to make church membership a model that actually is worth having instead of just a document that you sign and forget about and never hear about again. We want church membership to be us together committing to grow spiritually. It's, uh, I've compared it to uh, a group of friends who've decided to hire a personal fitness trainer, and they all work out together, helping each other out, getting trained by a personal fitness trainer in order to achieve results. And I believe that church membership should and can work the same way. And I've literally been taking you through the very first membership class of the new reality 2.0. So again, if you've missed any of the weeks, you really, 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 really need to watch them online or at least read the notes. Because next week uh, is, we could call it Commitment Sunday. I know it's a scary word. But what we're going to do today at the end of service is hand out the membership agreements, the document. You, if, you've, if you've ever been a member here at any other church, you always sign some kind of agreement that says, I'm going to do this, that, and the other thing. Well, it's no different, but this one's actually two-sided, which we'll talk about later in the service where we're going to be handing those out to each individual. Membership is an individual thing. Uh, even though families can do it, we still want individuals to do it. But we're going to be handing them out at the end of service to each one of you so you can take them home. You can read through them, look up the scriptures that are listed, tell for yourself if you think this is what you want to be a part of, if you want to commit to it. Uh, and as I said last week, you don't have to be a member to uh, actually attend and participate in what we do, but you will be missing out on the cool stuff that I talked about last week, especially if you were here, um, the family, the body of Christ. So moving on, let's start us off today reading the scripture that we've been using as our base for this whole series, and it's from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. It says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. This, this is what the church is supposed to be. This description here is what church is supposed to be. As we all do our parts, as we all work together, we can become healthy and growing and full of love, and we will look like the Acts 2 church that I covered several weeks ago. 
So it brings us to today. A couple weeks ago, I explained how the human body, uh, all the different parts, all the different systems are interdependent. They cannot, your muscles can't do anything on their own. Your skeletal system can't do anything on its own. They all have to work together to uh, perform the function of the body. And I said that last week we illustrated how when you're in that body, when you're in that family, you can give, 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 and never run out because everyone else around you is also give, 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 giving. And it was really cool, you know, example with some uh, plastic balls, which I'll do partly again today. But uh, another aspect, so all the different parts of the body, which were described as the body of Christ, all the different parts serve and love each other, but ultimately all the different parts serve the person that is, that the body belongs to. So in, in, in essence, your body, your, uh, and we could call that your soul. So the, the person who is really you, you know, it's not just your, your brain is actually just an organ too. Without the rest of your body, your brain would just be a lump of, you know, mess anyway. But the truth is, is the person that you are is what your body serves. And so in our case, uh, we could call that the soul, um, uh, and the physical body ultimately serves the soul. And in Scripture, Christ is called the head of his body, the head of his body. And the Greek concept of the head was not just this fleshy sphere on top of your neck. It was this idea of, it means like head of the family or the leader, the master, the Lord. So Christ is the head. He's the master. He's the Lord. He's the leader of his body, which is what we are. He is our head. He is our soul, so to speak. We exist to serve him. Just as the different parts of your human body exist to serve you, we, the body of Christ, exist to serve him. And this is the vertical relationship. Last week I talked about the horizontal relationship, how it is we serve and love each other. And today I'm going to talk about how it is we serve and love our king. I'm going to cover specifically what is expected of the different members of the body as we serve our king. So let's start with me, your pastor. What is my role in this body? Again, I'm just a part, just like you. Well, it just so happens that my role is spelled out specifically in Scripture. I'm very lucky. My job description is right there in the Bible. It says right there, it's in the verses we've just been reading. It says, these gifts Christ gave to the church, and one of them is a pastor. It says, my responsibility is to what? To equip God's people to do his work and to build up the church, the body of Christ. That's my job. That's what I'm called to do. And my role in this body pastor's role applies to all pastors, anyone who is a pastor. So uh, a children's pastor or an associate pastor or a youth pastor, our job, our calling, our mission from God is to equip and build up the church. So let's talk a little bit more about that. The Greek word translated as equip is katartismos, which means a bringing to a condition of fitness, perfecting. Oftentimes it's translated as perfecting. So really, my role as your pastor is to bring you to a condition of spiritual fitness. So basically, I'm your personal spiritual fitness trainer, right? And my job, my service to my king, my lord, my master, is to make you lean, mean, spiritual fighting machines. That's what I'm supposed to do. And in doing my job, I am also called to build up, build up the church, the Greek there for build up is oikodome. I'm taking Greek in the fall, so I might know how to say these things later. But anyway, oikodome for now. Constructive criticism and instruction that builds up a person to, the, to be suitable dwelling place of God. Ooh. Let's read that again. A constructive criticism and instruction that builds up a person to be suitable, to be the suitable dwelling place of God. That's a big job, don't you think? My role, what I'm supposed to do, my role in this body I've been talking about for the past three weeks. Uh, Basically, I believe God has called me to run this church for the purpose of equipping you, of building you up, for bringing you to a condition of fitness, and for making you a suitable dwelling place of God. And the scriptures in Ephesians, therefore, starting in verse 13, it says, This position, this role, this calling that I'm commanded to do will continue until we all come to what? Such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son 
that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standards of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. My job is to prevent that. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head, the master, the Lord of his body, us, the church. And he makes this whole body, all of us, fit together as each part. Each part does its own special work, including me. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So this is my part. And I promise, I promise to do this with all of my being. This is, this is why I cannot compromise. This is why I cannot run a comfy, cushy, come-as-you-are, stay-just-the-same kind of church. God won't let me. He has called me to something more. Is it a big task? Yes. Do I feel equipped for this? Adequate for this? No. (laughs) Do I believe God doesn't call the equipped, but he equips those he calls? Yes, I believe that. And I believe that God has been equipping me for years some, in some way, uh, just like a personal fitness trainer has been trained and equipped to do what they do, I have been also educated and trained, but more importantly, gifted by God to do my job as your spiritual fitness trainer. And I do not say this to boast. I do not. In fact, this is not of my doing. I didn't invent this. <laughs> in fact, I didn't ask for this. But I humbly accept the call with fear and trembling. Because scripture also tells me that I will not only be held accountable for my life, but I will be held accountable for the lives that I am put in care of. Your lives. And it's a sobering thought. And I'm just telling you like it is. I'm just keeping it real. But ultimately, I'm just a part of the body, just like you. We each have a role to play, and this is my role, and I accept it gladly with all humility. And I can't do my, but I can't do my job without your cooperation. So in the membership agreement, there's a line that says, this is something you're committing to, I will follow the leadership of my pastor as he equips me to do God's work. And I commit to practicing the spiritual disciplines that the Bible teaches me as clarified by my pastor to bring about spiritual maturity. Now, that is not following me as I do whatever I want. This isn't like just some party that I'm in charge of. This is following me as I follow Christ. In fact, I expect you, I ask you, if I ever stray, if you ever see that I do anything that would lead you astray from God's word, I expect you to call me on it, either by calling me out or not following me anymore, if I ever do that. This is not a position I take lightly nor for granted, and while it is a great burden, it is also a source of great joy. There is nothing better in this life than getting to see God work in you and knowing that I had some small part in that. There's nothing better. But enough about me. Let's talk about you. Basically, your part. Effectively, I could just take the Bible and throw it at you and say, read it and do it. (laughs) Because that's what it is. But then, of course, I wouldn't be doing my job. So let me take this big book and try to point out to you uh, four basic disciplines, some of you probably already know what these are, that are gleaned from Scripture that will result in the most spiritual growth. These are effectively the spiritual versions of eating right and exercise. You want to get physically fit, you got to eat right and exercise. You want to get spiritually fit, you have to do these four things. And members will commit So practicing and growing in these disciplines and allowing the church, me and others, to hold you accountable to that commitment. The wording in the membership agreement is such, it says, I willingly ask my church leaders and family to lovingly hold me accountable for practicing and growing in the following spiritual disciplines. And then there's the four listed, which I'll cover today. Now, a note about accountability. Well, first of all, if we didn't have it, what would be the point? Right? It's like, uh, what's the point of getting a gym membership if you never actually go? Or if you do go and all you do is sit at the, at the bike on your iPad or iPhone or watching the screen and not actually pedaling. What good does that do you? That kind of membership is not what we're talking about. You have to actually exercise while you're there to make a difference. Everyone knows this. 
Those people on The Biggest Loser don't lose weight just because they're on the TV show. They have to do the work, right? So like I said, you don't have to be a member to be a part of this church. But if you do want to be a member, and I strongly encourage that you do, we're going to talk about what is expected of you. Now, again, if you don't want to be a member and you're tired of hearing about this, come back, not, maybe not next week, but the week after, I'm going to be starting kind of normal Bible teaching, and I'll be covering a less divisive teaching like you know, a series on biblical creationism, young earth, that kind of stuff. All right, but if you are serious about spiritual fitness, if you really do want to grow and you, you are willing to do what it takes just like those Biggest Loser people are willing to do what it takes to change their lives. And this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where the difference is made. If you want to get fit, if you want to be all that God made you to be, and you want to know what it is to truly know the Lord, then this is how you do it. But I'm not just going to tell you what to do and then leave you to your own devices. Otherwise, again, what would be the point? I'd be setting you up for failure. But when you become a member... When you decide to say, yes, I'm willing to commit to these things. When you become a member, you not only join the amazing family, the amazing network of people that are committed to loving you, you also will have access to what we're calling a coaching system. We're still working it out with our advisory team. Uh, This idea of coaches who will basically be there to spot you when you're having trouble lifting the weight, so to speak. Uh, and we'll talk about more about that later. You make the commitment. We lovingly help you keep it, by, and we rejoice together as your life is changed in front of our eyes. So accountability, what is it? Well, it's loving encouragement to help you succeed in your goals of spiritual growth. Remember, this, this begins with you wanting to grow. Wanting, because you have Christ inside of you, You have a natural desire to grow more like him. You can't help it. It's part of being a Christian. And so as you have this desire, we're going to help you by lovingly encouraging you, hey, come to the gym today. Hey, man, where are you? That kind of accountability. It's what it's not. What it's not is legalistic stats watching so we can kick you when you're down. I know that's the word, that's probably what most of you think when you hear the word accountability. You're like, man, if I mess up one time, I'm out of here. That's not at all what this is. This is a, you can do it. Come on. You wanted this. We can help you. It's, it's going to be good for you. Trust me. Let me help you out. I've been there too. It's that kind of accountability. Get it? It's not a hammer. It's a, I don't have another term for that. All right, so... <laughs> I was trying to think of one, anyway. Basically, while it is necessary, so there's going to be a tension here, and I've talked about this with others, there's this tension to manage. It is necessary, unfortunately, it is necessary to have something of a list of things to do. But the primary focus of this experiment is actually personal relationships. It's people helping people. But we would be doing you a disservice if there weren't actually some minimum requirements. It'd be like, basically, you hire a personal fitness trainer, and all you guys ever do is hang out and eat burgers together. What would be the point, right? So I hope, I hope you understand that. This is not about legalistic, all right, we're gonna, we are going to measure things. We are going to track things, but it's not for the purpose of like, all right, you were just shy of making the mark. We're going to pound you. It's so that we can tell the coaches, hey, so-and-so needs a little bit of help, needs a little bit of encouragement, needs a little bit of, hey, can I pray with you? Hey, can I help you? That's what this is about. It's people helping people. It's doing life together, but it's doing life together with a purpose. It's not just hanging out. It's that purposeful love that we talked about last week. So, what are the disciplines? There's four of them. They're not listed in any particular hierarchical order, but I had to list them in some order because we live in linear time and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, number one is fellowship. Fellowship. This one we already talked about last week. It's basically doing life together. It's our mission to what? Do we uh, do life together in what? Authentic community. It's also called fellowship. It's being a part of the family and spending time with each other, not just for having fun, but with intentional acts of growth. It's basically making church attendance a priority. Because it's hard to be we 
when it's just me. It's participating in the things that we do as a family, like potlucks, events, small groups, things like that. So membership will include a commitment to doing life together, to participating in what we do as a church family, and especially being here on Sundays. While we do believe that life groups, the small groups, the doing life in smaller groups during the week is the absolute best way to grow spiritually, all we're really asking is that you at least make a priority of being here on Sundays. Okay? That's the minimum commitment. The actual wording of the membership agreement is, I will, on a regular basis, diligently spend time with God's people to the extent that I am able, that's the key, by attending our Sunday morning services and participating in our life groups and other gatherings. It's not so hard, is it? Hebrews tells us, it says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds by not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. And there is a day approaching. And this is actually something we can help you with by measuring and holding you accountable because it can be measured. So one thing we're going to start doing, not next Sunday, but maybe the next is tracking individual attendance of at least members. And we're going to do that by, on your bulletin here, we're going to ask that basically everybody put your name on it and put it in the offering at the end of service. If you're already a member, we're going to have, like I said, we're going to hand out membership agreements at the end today. There's going to be a member, new member information because we're resetting our database. So even, if, even though we already have a lot of your info, we're, you're still going to want to give it to us. So if we already have your info, you just put your name. Hey, I'm here. You're letting us know that you showed up. It's letting us lovingly hold you accountable. And I'm sure some of you are freaking out about that right now. But we got to do something. This isn't just, hey, I'm going to do it, and then you don't hear about it again. This is different. This is different. If you really want what this is, has to offer, if you really want to grow spiritually, if you really want to get fit, then it shouldn't be that hard to commit to just being here on Sunday. Right? Now, with that said, um, I, uh, there are some exceptions. We're not expecting 100% attendance, but once a month is really not enough. Right? Now, again, there are exceptions. Many of you work on Sunday. Many of you have duty, or you go out to sea, or you have babies, or you get sick. All these other things that, of course, are reasonable reasons to miss church. And so what we're not going to do is we're not going to be, all right, stats, stats, stats. Oh, look, you know, Kevin, he was here for 98% of the time. Hey, Kevin, where are you, man? You said you were going to be here. Hey, man, my mom died or something. You know, it's... it's it's not going to be like that. Basically, we're going to be tracking, and we don't have it quite figured out what the numbers are yet. We're, this is an experiment, folks. We're figuring this out kind of as we go. But what we're going to do is we're going to say, you know what, Kevin, it looks like you've been gone for like five weeks. Is everything okay? Is there, is there something? No, man, I've just been underway. Oh, well, that's sweet, man. That's, that's cool. Is there any way we can help you out, like send you the sermons on your, on your boat or whatever it is? That's, it's like that. You get it? You understand this? This is not us keeping track so we can pound you. It's so we can help you, so we can notice. Sometimes, you know, there's a lot of you. It's not easy to notice who specifically is not here on a Sunday so I can call you and say, hey, how you doing? Can I pray for you? This helps us know, helps us to know you're here. All right, enough about that. So again, uh, we know there are exceptions, uh, and we'll cover those kind of one at a time. I can't cover every possible situation here this morning. I don't have time for it, but there will be a time for questions Later. All right, moving on. The next two disciplines are things that are really not that easy to measure, but they are absolutely crucial. Crucial to growing spiritually. The first one, number two on our list today, is time with God's Word. You knew that was coming. You knew it. This one should be obvious, right? Every person who calls Jesus their Lord should be able to at least dedicate 15 minutes of their day to listen to Him talk. You just should. You listen to your Facebook that long, right? Anyway, so if you are serious about knowing God, then you absolutely no way around it. Must read what he wrote, otherwise you only know him through hearsay. Whatever the preacher said, whatever I heard so-and-so say, you only get to know him by reading what he specifically wrote. Just like you only get to know another person by talking to them directly. Make sense? All right. 
2 Timothy 3 says, All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong with our lives. Of course, most of us don't like to know what's wrong with our lives, and that's why we don't read it. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So God's word is the primary tool. Primary tool. For he uses to equip his people. Romans 12 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Do you want to know what God's will is for your life? Do you want to give God proper worship? Do you want to be changed, to be transformed? Then you have to renew your mind. You have to stop filling it with junk and fill it with God's word. This is how it works. It's just, like, it's just like if you want to get healthy, you can't eat sugar and junk food all the time. And if you, oh, you know, I'm going to get healthy, so I'm going to add a salad once a week. <laughs> it ain't going to work, is it? You have to actually start eating protein and vegetables and things like that. See, I know this, but I don't necessarily do it. Especially, I'll talk about that another time. But you get it. The laws don't change just because we don't follow them, okay? So, how... Uh, how do we help you with this? Okay, so again, this isn't just, hey, read your word. You said you're gonna. I expect you to. That ain't it. How are we gonna help you with this? Now, one of the ways uh, we're gonna, we can recommend, there's version. There's lots of reading plans on there you can use. Uh, there's all kinds of ways that can help make reading the Bible easy. We'll hook you up with accountability partners. Me and my friends, for years now, we you know, do the version. take the little picture. Hey, I read today. Text it to my buddy. It's kind of holding us accountable. Now, if you don't have someone that you necessarily want to hook up with yet, we're working on a plan where you can kind of let the church keep you accountable, where you can send us text messages and things like that. We used to do that Word Up program a couple years ago. We're going to bring that back. Some of you remember that. But basically, we want to help you. We want to put the tools in your hand to help you get to reading your Bible. And, and we hold you accountable to it. We ask you about it. Hey, man, are you doing it? Hey, what did you read last week? We'll figure, we'll figure out how exactly we're going to do that later. So um, the uh, membership agreement says, I will, on a regular basis, diligent, lis- diligently listen to God by reading and or listening to his written word. And we're going to help you get started with that if you need it. All right, the next one is prayer. Prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. God's word is him talking to you, prayer is you talking back. Basically, you can learn a lot about God by reading his word, but you get to know God by talking to him, by casting your cares on him, by pouring your heart out to him. Uh, Obviously, this is uh, the one that we can't really hold you accountable for. I mean, it's a personal thing. We can't. There's no way to track it, really. Um, but we can help you. We have, we'll have coaches. We'll have people who have been doing this a while, who can kind of teach you, who can help you get through, because praying can be difficult. So the membership agreement is, I will, on a regular basis, diligently spend time with God by talking to Him in prayer. One thing that I practice uh, is something called prayer journaling. I actually write out my prayers whenever I uh, it's not I pray continually you know in the car or other places like that we're just basically kind of keeping God in mind but the the deep prayers the specific prayers I type them out in Evernote I have a whole list of them and it's just kind of it, it actually it's really nice because it for one my mind I get distracted when I'm trying to pray just on my own you know as soon as I start talking to God I think about whatever else in the world I can think about I'm sure none of you have that problem <laughs> but Typing it out actually helps. It makes me focus a little bit more. And then sometimes I just type a question and I wait. And I try to listen. And if maybe a thought comes to mind, I type it out. See, maybe that's an answer from God. And then I do it several days. And if it's consistent, then I I think God's talking to me. In fact, I've used that a lot in preparing for what it is we're doing here at the church. And a cool thing is you can look back on past prayers and see how God has answered them or even changed you in the process. So anyway, I could teach you how to do that if you want. So prayer is a crucial part of growth. It's how you know God intimately. And although we can't hold you accountable for it, we do expect you to commit to it. And we will help you. We'll help you. That's the whole point. It's let us help you. All right. Number four uh, of the four is giving. Giving. 
If Bible reading, prayer, and fellowship are the eating right of spiritual fitness, giving is the exercise. The other three feed you. I'm praying, I'm talking to God, I'm reading his word, I'm hanging out with people who love me. Giving is the exercise. It's also the hardest of the disciplines to start, uh, but also the most rewarding once you actually get going. It's not unlike weightlifting or running. It's so hard to start, but once you kind of get in a groove, don't you ever notice that it uh, feels good? You look forward to it. Uh, basically, doing the other three and not giving is like practicing a lot but never playing in the game. It's a whole lot of listening without a lot of doing. So the primary statement in the membership agreement reads, I will, on a regular basis, diligently give back to God a portion of all that he has given me, which is all that I am and have. Basically, we're only expected, God only expects us to give out of what has been given to us, which is everything, right? In Scripture, we are expected to give back to him in Two basic ways, two major categories. The first is our time, our time in service to God through his church, the body of Christ. The membership agreement reads, I will on a regular basis give back to God a portion of the time he gives me by serving this church both as needed and in my area of unique talents and spiritual gifts. Since all of the time you and I have is given to us by God, it seems only fitting that we should use at least some of it to serve him. And not only does he give us time, he gives us abilities, talents, and even spiritual gifts that he expects us to use in serving him as parts of his body. Remember how in a human body all the different parts uh, and systems basically serve the purpose of the body? Well, that's what we're part of his body. And so we're supposed to serve his purpose. And Paul speaks of this in uh, a few places in 1 Corinthians 12. He talks about the necessity for there being different kinds of parts. We're all very different, not all the same, because uh, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be, right? In Romans 12, he gets a little more specific. He says, For just as each of us has one body with many parts, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. It is, if it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Basically, this is not an exhaustive list of the various spiritual gifts and talents given to us by God, but do you see how he is encouraging every one of us to use those gifts in service to the church? Church. Peter said in 1 Peter 4, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. And it says, of course, in our main scripture in Ephesians 4, 16, that he makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and fully full of love. The body simply does not work right if the members aren't doing their own special work. They're not performing their function. Basically, what this means is that you were created by God for a reason. And a specific reason that only fits into the context of his body. In fact, apart from Christ's body, your life and my life have no purpose or meaning. This is why Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Think about that for a second. Your life, my life, has no purpose or meaning outside of the context that you were part of the body of Christ and have a function and a purpose to perform there. Something to think about. And the physical manifestation of his body on earth is the church as a whole. The whole church, which of course is made up of local churches, which they themselves make up parts of the whole body, which I talked about in the series Church, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, if you want to look it up. God expects you to use his, the gifts he gave you for his service and for the benefit of your fellow members. He expects it. And as you do that, here's the great thing, as you do that, you will find that the once what was once something you were simply good at, as you use it for the service of the king, you become more fruitful than you ever imagined 
doing it just for yourself. I can personally attest to this. This is why I'm standing in front of you. It's amazing. When you use your natural abilities and especially your spiritual giftings for God's service, it's way better than doing it for yourself. Way better. You can do so much more. So members will commit to learning what your spiritual gifts are and you, and you commit to using them to serve the church in some way. And the best way to find out what your gift is is to try out different things and see what resonates with you. We have all kinds of volunteer teams you can join. Uh, I'm also interested in new ideas, adding some awesome, that kind of stuff. But regardless of what you do, to be a member, you must do something because in this family, everyone helps out. It just works that way. I'm sure you have questions, but I'll be happy to answer them at another time. I have to move on. The second thing we give is our financial resources in support of the mission of God's church, the body of Christ. The wording of the membership agreement is, I will on a regular basis give back to God a portion of the monetary income he provides for me by contributing financially to this church. Now, for some reason, this is the hardest one for many. Actually, it's not just some reason. Jesus knew all too well the connection between our wallets and our hearts. This is why he specifically warned us not to store treasure on earth, but to store it in heaven, that you can't serve both God and money. And the cure for worry is to what? Seek his kingdom first, and everything else will be added. You can look up the details in Matthew 6. But you see, God doesn't want your money. He wants your trust. He wants your trust. He wants us to acknowledge that our provision comes from him, not from ourselves. He knows that we trust our money more than we trust him because we will easily skip church to go to work, but will we skip work to go to church? Because we mistakenly think we we can't live a day without money, but we can live a day without God. And I could go on and on about this topic because it's had such a huge impact on my life. I most certainly would not be here in front of you if I had not started this discipline years ago and seen God do amazing things in my life. And I want the same for you. I want you to have peace about money, which is what I have. I haven't worried about money for years, despite having my pay cut in half twice. The fact is God has always provided far more than enough. Did you catch that? My pay went down, but my living went up. How does that happen? Which would you rather have? More money, lots of money with lots of stress, or less money with no worries? Of course, we would all like to have both, lots of money and no worries, but do we ever see that in life? Do we ever see the people, especially in Hollywood, big business, the ones you hear about, chasing after the almighty dollar, having so much of it, divorce rates skyrocketing, suicide, depression, all kinds of things. Why? Because money is their God. Jesus promises a worry-free life. A worry-free life. This is why I tell you, you don't have to worry when we get this one right. Look it up, Matthew 6. And of course, I'm not saying you'll necessarily have less money. You may very well have a lot more money. But does it really matter how much you have if you are content? Does it matter the number if there's peace inside? So because I love you, because I want you to grow, members will also commit to giving financially to the church. And while I am a believer, a firm believer in tithing, 10% off the top, that's not what I mean by this. I don't expect that. We'll be simply expected to give something on a regular basis and put your name on it so we can lovingly keep you accountable. How much and how often is up to you and your personal level of faith. And again, we have coaches who can help you figure that out. 2 Corinthians 9 says, remember this. This is Paul talking to the Corinthians. He says, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give, and and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And here's 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 the best part. And God, almighty God, of heaven's army, says, God will generously provide all that you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Do you believe God's word? 
Do you trust him? Then put your trust into action. So to illustrate this whole point about giving of our time, treasure, talent, and so on, I want to turn your attention to this table. Behold, everything that you have created on your own. Marvel at your personal ingenuity, your willpower to create and give yourself so much goodness. Hmm. Or is it perhaps that you didn't do any of this? Perhaps even the ability to earn money was a gift from God. Perhaps. So let's look at this. So, so first God makes you. Knits you together in your mother's womb. Right? We've heard of that. He makes you. And then he not only makes you the person. He gives you all kinds of cool stuff. Like, you know, a brain that thinks. Uh, he made you born maybe in America, or the land of the free, home of the brave, all that kind of stuff. Gave you maybe some good parents, maybe not so good parents, but you're still alive and living right now, aren't you? Gave you the ability to think, to produce, talents, a drive, all that kind of stuff. He gave you good stuff. And so what do we do? We, uh, we take all that. And we start out life me-minded. It's mine. Yeah, I know I was born an infant and it took years for my parents to actually bring me to a place where I could support myself. But it's me. It's mine. I did it. I did all this. And I'm not going to give any of it up. I'm going to keep it safe. My precious babies. But the life that God has for us Instead of being me-minded, last week we talked about we-minded, where we give to others. God wants us to be he-minded. God first. He gives us all this stuff. It's like you give your kid a bag of Skittles, right? And all he does is he says, you know what? I've given, without me, you had nothing. Nothing. I gave all of this to you, and I want you to just give a little bit of it back to me to expand my kingdom, to support my mission, to be a part of my body. And then when you do, this is what he does. More than you need. God will richly provide all I need and plenty to left over to share. And then you'll, you know what, that worked really good. I'm going to give a little bit more to God. He says, you know what, I'm going to open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing you can't contain it. And while that's going on, you're doing the we and you're loving each other and you try to give it all away and you never run out. This is what the life is like when you have God first, when you seek his kingdom first, when you give of yourselves to others and to him, you don't run out. You get this fear over here that if I give any of it away, I'll have less. But the truth is you won't. Do you get it? This is what God says in his word. Do you believe it? And if you do, will you not commit to saying, yes, I will be a part of this body. I will participate. I will expand the kingdom with my money, with my time, with my talents. I will spend time with the people of God. Is it so much to ask when everything you have was given to him, given to you by him? Is it so much to ask? I don't think so. So you decide, which bucket do you want to be? Which one do you want to be? But the ultimate question the ultimate question is not about money. It's not about time or, or talent or, or any of this other stuff. The ultimate question is, do you trust God more than yourself? Because that's what this is all about. It all points to, do I trust God more than me? Do I trust God or do I trust me? You see, growing spiritually, what it actually is, what the sign of it is, is learning to trust God more than myself. It's going from here to here. Go back to the other one. It's going from trusting me more to trusting God more. It says it right there in Proverbs. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, all of your heart, and don't lean on what? Your own understanding. Trust God. Trust God and not yourself. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you, he will direct your path. He will richly provide all you need and so much more. 
It's all about getting to know him. And a big part of getting to know someone is trust. And ultimately, here's the other part, is that trust requires action. It's not enough just to say you trust Jesus. You have to do what he says. It's more than just feeling or thinking something in your head. It has to produce action. In fact, the evidence of trust is action. James 1.22 says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Trust requires action. Action. So those are the practices, the disciplines that cause spiritual growth. Bible reading, prayer, fellowship, giving. They're the eating right and the exercising of spiritual fitness. And they are all required, not just for membership, but to actually grow, to actually become spiritually mature. And I can promise you, I can guarantee you that if you do these things, your life will be changed. There's no way around it. If you eat right and exercise, you will get healthy. If you do the spiritual disciplines, you will grow spiritually. Your life will be changed from the inside out. You will be transformed. You can't deny it, and you can't get around it if you actually do these things. And here's the best part is you don't have to do it alone. You don't have to do it alone. You don't have to be like, oh, I'm going to try. I'm going to do my best, but I just don't. (laughs) You don't have to do it alone. That's the whole point of this. That's the whole point of this membership being a part of the we is that it's not me trying to figure it out. It's we doing it together, loving each other, helping each other grow. That's what Jesus called us to. What a glorious part of living, is it not? The rest of the world says you got to do it on your own. But God says do it with others. Do it with my family. Do it with me guiding you, protecting you, using people to help people. This is what it's all about. It's about becoming we as we are dedicated to seeing our lives changed. This isn't just, you know, our vision is to see lives changed. It includes us. I don't want to just use all of you to to help people out there. I do, but it's about changing us. It's about us growing, us changing. It's we being dedicated to seeing our lives changed by the transforming, restoring power of Jesus Christ. And the steps are that we are united. talked about that the second week. We love each other that agape kind of love that we talked about last week. And finally, we serve God together. And our lives change because of it. And it is my job, my calling, my duty, and my great joy to equip you and to build you up toward that end. And as your personal spiritual fitness trainer, I have just laid out your fitness plan. And I'm going to be here to encourage you and lift you up and do everything I can to help you grow me and others who are as dedicated. Now the membership agreement, very quickly, because I'm totally out of time, is double-sided. The one side lists the things I talked about today and a couple others of what you will commit to the church as a member. But the other side is what we, what I, the church, will commit to you. And so I'll quickly cover those. One is that we promise to actively love you as commanded by Jesus in John 13, defined in 1 Corinthians 13, and acted out via the one another's found throughout Scripture. Now, this is actually an echo of something you will commit to the church members, is that basically we're committing to love each other like we talked about last week. The next one is we, we, the church, promise to care enough for you to hurt when you are hurting, to rejoice when you rejoice. We promise to do what we can to help you when a need arises in your life. And we promise to lovingly hold you accountable to these agreements you made with us today by providing a network of coaches who will encouragingly help you achieve your spiritual goals. That's our side. Your side we've talked about. And it has to start with you. I can't do it for you. You have to decide Do you really want this or not? 
You have to decide if you're willing to give God a chance to change your life by joining with the portion of the body of Christ that is Reality Church. Doesn't, you know, we're not the only one in town necessarily, but you're here. <laughs> Why not be a part of this? And I so hope that you will, because I love you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, I praise your name. I fall at your feet and worship you. Because you are good and you are sovereign. You've chosen us to be here today, to be a part of this experiment that you've laid on my heart some time ago, and you've brought others on board. And as big of a risk as it may be, Lord, to ask people to commit to something, you called me to do it, and so I have. And I pray that this message that was delivered today speaks to the hearts of those that are here and those that will listen online, that you will just, you tell them that the day, there's a day coming, Lord. The time is near, and it's time to decide if we're with you or not. And I pray that for each one of us that we decide to be with you too. As the song says, decide to follow you, no turning back. Even if none go with me, still I will follow. I pray that is the heart of each one of us today as we leave. And I give you praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name.